What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Celtics Talk podcast. Things have gotten a little quiet, but we're going to try to manufacture some content tonight. And to do that, my friend from Boston Sports Journal and, of course, the Locked On Celtics podcast, John Corrales, who, if you're tuning in on the YouTube version, you might see it's not his normal background setup. And I was just kind of busting his shops about it. I said, uh, is he at a beach house or like a a, game. On, on location? But uh, evidently, it's a you know his new home and home might uh, might might be seeing more of these uh, of this location right. coming yeah. down the road. Got to set up, got to set up the road studio, so <laughs> I'll mix it up a little bit. It's all right. Uh, I'm trying to think what would be my road studio because my mom's down in South Carolina, but I haven't done any zooming from there because I haven't been down in South Carolina. But I do plan on you know setting something up when I'm down there because I'm going to be there for a couple of weeks and it'll be summer league. But uh, this is what we do. We are uh, we are professionals. Right at uh basketball talking and we're supposed to be able to do it from anywhere professional basketball talkers i've 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 podcasted from my car on the way home from games which is actually quite agreeable because you have a lot of time to kill um and i always tell jay king i'm like hey i'm in my car for an hour if you need somebody for your for your podcast and you know i I extend that invitation to anybody because i'm just trying to stay awake half the time so uh it's uh it's much appreciated that you've uh you've you've navigated the circumstances john corrales to uh to bring me this podcast well look the the video element does does add a new (laughs) wrinkle to all of this because I have to bring my web camera, but mm. I've I've podcasted live from the TD Garden, so I've done I've done the the, the carry everything with me podcast setup before, so I figure I could do it. It's I'm very mobile with this. It's a very like mobile journalist kind of setup here. That let me just say this: there's duct tape involved. So <laughs> there is. Uh, I mean, same here. I mean, people think this looks this is a snazzy looking background and all that. It is all being held together by. By duct tape and plywood. Chicken wire and bubble gum. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to keep these things going. All right, let's uh, let's talk. It's been a little bit quiet ever since. You know, felt like there was a flurry of activity there. Kemba gets traded, then you have Eme getting hired. A uh, little bit of a lull here as we sort of uh, wait for the season to end and get into the real heavy lifting. But that's why I kind of wanted to uh, to pick your brain a bit because to keep myself busy. I've started diving into a little bit of like, what's ahead for the Celtics? And I think they have two real assets that they can use this summer to add talent uh, beyond re-signing their own guys. And and obviously Evan Fournier feels like the first domino that will, that will have to fall and dictate how it plays out. I guess let's start there before we get into what I was, what I have planned with some of our favorite uh, Gordon Hayward trade exception guys and mid-level guys. What do you think happens here with Evan Fournier? And is that is, does that have to be the first domino so that the Celtics can sort of plot their path forward? I feel like he's the first one to fall. Yeah, because you have to know what you're looking for. And, and Evan Fournier is probably, you know, in looking at the options that are out there, Evan Fournier is the, the best of the, the, the options because you have his bird rights and you can theoretically sign him to anything. So you're not limited by taxpayer mid-level. You're not limited by the size of the traded player exception. So you've got a good player that you can figure out exactly how you want to use him. And uh, the, the first step is figuring out, does he fit into your plans financially? Um, I, I've been kicking around like, a, is it going to be a two-year contract? Because do they want that cap space? And, and then you know, realizing that they could offer him a three-year deal if they wanted to and, and trade it if mm-hmm. you know, a, a signable player, a signable star becomes available. So I think something, you know, in, in the three years, $50 million range, somewhere in there would, would get it done and okay. still be a something with an average annual value, 15 million, you know, 15 million or so, you know, 16 million, whatever. And that, w- that would be a good value and very tradable because $15 million guys are, are easy to move. I was told there'd be no math and you've already made me start calculating <laughs> uh, average annual value, but what's your, what's your, what's the number that scares you? Because I do think, you know, especially after the Kemba trade, they've promoted some flexibility here and what they can do to re-sign him. At first I was thinking, man, if they have to get up into that 15, $16 million range, all of a sudden it gets a little prohibitive in terms of, of the tax, but now with the, the, the Kemba for Horford benefit, you know, but, but what number if a team swoops in and we know, cause we do this every year, we say, Celtics are in the power position. They've got his rights. There's, you know, there's not a lot of teams with cap space. And then the New York Knicks get crazy and come in with $20 million. What is your, I'm not sure I'm going there number. 
that's the number right there. 20. I'm not going, I'm not going above 17 for per, you know, per year, like that first year, I want to keep it somewhere around 15, 16, which I mean, he was making what 17 last season. Yeah. So keep it right around what, what he was making, offer him the raises because, you know, next year it gets a little bit different with the taxes and you can figure other stuff out. So I, I think anything above 17 gets to be like, all right, we're, we're, we're pushing it here. But you're right. That's the exact scenario that we should be afraid of. The, the New York Knicks saying, we've got oodles of cap space. We need somebody here. Uh, we're going to throw you 20 plus million dollars a year for, you know, for one year. Here's mm-hmm. one year, $22 million or some stupid number. And then you could be a free agent next year. And he would be kind of, you know, he'd have to take it. So that, that's, that's the thing that scares me. Because I don't think anybody else is going to make an offer that's crazy. Right. It's, it's either the Knicks do something or somebody with cap space does something for one year that just because they have to spend the money or he's going to stay with the Celtics. And then the other ob- obvious hurdle here is, OK, the Celtics probably want to maintain their flexibility. You mentioned it. You know, can you do, I don't know, two plus one and or two with a slightly guaranteed third year to give yourself some wiggle room in case you do need to get off that money. But if another team swoops in and the money's equal, but they go four years, like all of a sudden it gets a little bit more difficult and, and, and 48 at 28. You know, you're not as scared. If he was 30, 31, teams would probably be looking at it, wanting to do a short-term deal. But yeah, I think there's some some variables here. And I wonder how quickly it'll get sorted out so that the Celtics can figure out again, okay, are they going to use the full mid-level? Are they going to be stuck with that taxpayer mid-level? And so uh, they, they have to figure that out pretty quick. And here's Fournier over at the Olympics. It's not like you've got a chance to sit down. Like obviously his agent can, you know, maybe they've got a sense already of where he's at. And maybe that's part of the reason they were able to dive right in and start, start making that Kemba like move. But you know, Brad Stevens got to got to move here because we know how quick those guys, the rest of the league is going to come off the table, especially when there's such a quick turnaround to the new season. Well, the good thing is, is that the Celtics aren't going to be in contention for any of the really big free agents. Mm-hmm. Like they, they can't they can't pull a sign and trade because that'll hard cap them. We know that they don't want to do that. Um, uh, so I feel like where the Celtics have some advantage if they know what they're going to offer Evan Fournier, if they've already kind of back channeled that, that number and, and are comfortable what the result is going to be either Evan doesn't move or he, or he does sign or whatever uh, they they'll know right away. And then they can kind of execute that plan. But as, as we sit here talking about traded player exceptions and taxpayer mid-level guys, those aren't the guys that move first. So mm-hmm. Brad at least has the advantage of saying, you know, to the, to the, the mid-level taxpayer, mid-level guys, he can talk to them first and kind of have his pick of that crew while the rest of the league is fighting over the, you know, the bigger fish. The one big fish. Like if, if Kawhi opts out and not like he would know where he's going anyway. Right. Like, and he's got right. an ACL tear. Right. So, you know, I don't know. That's why, that's why I'm fascinated. I just feel like, especially last off season, it felt like things happened quickly because of everyone was sort of like the season starting. We need to just move. And I wonder if there'll be a feeling of the same thing now, although there will be two months until the October kind of camp gatherings and stuff like that. So uh, a little bit of, of time to play with, you know, I, I'm tempted to dive into Robert Williams extension. I'm tempted to dive into uh, Marcus Smart's extension, but you know, we've got, we've got plenty of time to kind of go down those road. I want to start with uh, the, all the topics. Now we got a whole lot. I mean, I mean, that's the thing, you know, I don't want to burn through everything. I've got, I've got weeks to fill on this little uh, adventure here. I mean, you do it on the daily. I mean, I, you're going to have to really grind here, man. Uh, let's start with mid-level guys. That was the, because, and you know, I got some pushback from uh, smart cap people who say, you know, it's not necessarily, not necessarily true that the Celtics are going to use the rest of that Gordon Hayward traded player exception because of, the fact that, again, you, you have some tax concerns and you can't just take on 11 more million dollars without necessarily moving out of Tristan Thompson along the way or figuring out that money. And that's absolutely true. But I do think you can't emerge from this uh, from this Gordon Hayward TPE and just be like, well, we've got Evan Fournier, hopefully. Uh, so, you know, let's say they do elect to use this. Give me, we're going to ping pong here a little bit. I want to give our, our top three guys and I told you we're doing this blind, so we might have the same top three guys. You might have somebody wild on there who I'm going to steal and then write a whole column about. <laughs> um, 
So I can't wait to, for this to generate my next week of content, but sure. give me, give me your, if you are Brad Stevens and you have the $11 million remaining on the Gordon Hayward traded player exception, who is your number one target in terms of a realistic option you want him to go get? Okay. So this is okay. Realistic is, is kind of, I'm fudging the realistic. That's, that's fine. Like, you know, Brad Stevens, number one option shouldn't be a guy who's like an obvious slam dunk to be gettable. It should be someone who you really want, but that you're you know, not sure if you're going to get them. So, so the guy I've been, I've been talking about a lot is Jermichael Green. As I know my health. And Jermichael Green, and, and why I think it's possible, mm-hmm. it, it's only because I think he would, he would be in the uh, Jeremy Grant kind of, I want a bigger role okay. than what I'm getting in Denver. And if he can go to the East – and still be on a contender and play with good players and have a, a starting role. What I would say, my pitch as, as GM is if you're, if you're looking to leave Denver, he's got a player option for seven, seven point four million million, basically. Mm-hmm. If you're planning on scanning the, the, the landscape and opting out, you're going to get somewhere around that. He's not going to get more than seven or $8 million. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the, the feeling that I get. So he could be looking for a better opportunity or he could tell Denver, Hey, look, here's what I'm doing. I'm leaving, mm-hmm. but I'm going to pick up my player option and you're going to trade me to Boston and they're going to give you a second round pick. And you're not going to, you're not going to lose me for nothing. So you're going to get something for me versus nothing for me because I'm leaving no matter what. And so that that's my pitch. If he's looking for a starting role, and then I would say you have Smart, Tatum, Brown, Jermichael Green as your starting four as a stretch four, and Robert Williams as your center. And I, I kind of like that with Evan Fournier coming off the bench because I want a scenario where Evan Fournier comes off the bench rather than starts to really provide some punch for that second unit. So that, that's my number one target for the TPE. Well, first off, I want to thank you for putting Robert Williams in your starting five because uh, that endears you to this program even more immediately. And I do think there's some room for discussion about whether that happens. I do believe, to me, it's rather obvious. If he's healthy, that's his role. Like, that's you just roll with it. And, you know, whether you bring out Horford off the bench or you experiment with them in that four or five role, which I don't love, uh, you know, like there, there's at least options. But Robert Williams needs to play and he needs to play uh, a yeah. lot. If yeah. he's healthy. So to me, it's, it, it, that's an obvious decision. Uh, I put you Michael Green on, on, on my list. I agree. You know, it's a scenario where you look at Denver's cap sheet, they just don't have the resources if they don't make another move or, or, or even if they do, if they, if they package some of these younger guys and go get a uh, Ben Simmons of the world or whatever their, you know, whatever their plan would be to add another a, a super talented player alongside, like with, with, with Aaron Gordon and Jamal Murray and Jokic, it's like the, the cap sheet is, is, is way up there. So they got a trim salary. And a lot of the guys that I look at in this scenario is like, who can Boston reasonably say, Hey, just take, give us that contract for a pick. Uh, you know, we know you don't want to take back Tristan Thompson in this scenario. So like, let's make it work by like making your lives a little bit easier in terms of salary commitment. So that, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if I'm ready to throw him into the starting role, but uh, I would be intrigued to see how he how he looks out there and, and how he fits. I feel like we've had uh, a lot of Jim Michael Green would be perfect for the Celtics moments over the last like five years in terms of like every time we kind of scour the landscape for a power forward. And yet, then again, sort of the last couple of years has been any power forward who is serviceable and, <laughs> and has some veteranness to them. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. Uh, I'm going to, my, my number one on my list, if, you know, and, and again, I'm, 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 this is probably my shoot for the moon candidate is to call Memphis about Kyle Anderson. And I think mm-hmm. slow-mo fits that same sort of power forward role where, you know, slots nicely. I think everything he does complements this core. He's obviously coming off maybe his best season as a pro. I guess that's part of the reason I'm wondering why Memphis would be even I'm not eager, but uh, even just agreeable to moving on from him. But he fits really nicely. And I think uh, if nothing else, I'm Brad Stevens and I call and say, hey, uh, we gave you a pretty good deal last uh, last year at the, at, at, at the NBA draft, uh, sort of gave you the number 30th 
pick, number 30 pick for, for nothing. You know, Ennis Cantor went to Portland anyway. Uh, could you do us a solid? We need a power forward. Uh, maybe we can you, can, you can, you can go even younger there. Uh, and maybe they sweeten it somehow, but they're definitely going to have to sweeten it. So, uh, but I love slow mo's game. And I, uh, I just kind of, I'm trying to dream about, you know, shoot big because this is one of the few ways you have to add talent there. Uh, the problem is I just wonder if, if, if they have enough to, to pry him up because the one thing that we should mention in all of this and, and that I'm, I've sort of navigated this, this realistic theory is you you can't include first round picks because you need to stockpile all those for the inevitable trade for a third star that is coming further down the road. Now, maybe, maybe you can clear the, the room to cap space in 2023 or maybe even sooner, but uh, I'm operating under the guise of they made that Kemba trade when they did, because they don't want, they needed every first round pick available such that when that next star comes out, they can say, all right, we're giving you a 22, 24, 26. We'll give you pick swaps in 23 and 25. And there's no hindrance to that. I don't know what you do in that instance to, to make Memphis uh, a little bit more agreeable to that deal, but uh, maybe there's something you have that they like, and uh, maybe it's, it, it goes even beyond just the TPE. Yeah, maybe, maybe you, you can, but the, the beauty of the TPE is you can kind of play with it a little bit and, and you don't have to worry about matching necessarily the salaries. Uh, we can call it kind of like a non-simultaneous uh, Desmond Bain, Kyle Anderson, exactly. play, you know, so uh, I like that a little bit more. His name's come up. A lot of people have asked me about him. Uh, the, the advantage, I think, would be getting, you know, if they got somebody younger, maybe there's, maybe they feel like one of the Celtics end of the bench projects could be somebody that that mm-hmm. fits with their kind of, you know, we throw around Carson Edwards a lot, but they need shooting. They, they did not shoot threes uh, well at all. So, uh, well, I mean, except for Desmond Bain. But they, they, they could use, I don't know, some other, some other shooter there. So maybe you say, hey, take, take a flyer on him and, and, and who knows. But, yeah. yeah, I think Kyle Anderson, he's not really on their timeline. And so you, you get somebody younger or you, you give them an opportunity. Maybe that second-round pick is something that they think they can play with a little bit. Um, I like that idea. Um, what do you got in number two? Number two, again, kind of, kind of reaching here, but I would call Chicago about Sadoransky. Yeah, no, I mean, so he's actually number, he's like listed number one on my list. Cause I think it's just so obvious, yeah. but, go ahead. but I, I want you, you, you can set it up. Well, because so, so my goals this, this summer are ball handler and somebody, you know, stretch four type of guy. And however that plays out, whether you acquire one via uh, the, the, MLE and one yeah. of the TP. I don't care which one it is. So you, you, you cast that net and Sadoransky. I don't, I don't know that Chicago would be, would do it, but I, I've got to ask because mm-hmm. I think he, he has there. I'm, I go back to his Washington days and like, I still think like, I want that guy. Yeah. And, and I want to see if maybe getting him away from Chicago and getting him a bigger role can get him um, can, can kind of recapture some of the, the, the older play from Chicago. I mean, from, from Washington. And then you kind of like, you, you can play with it a little bit. Do you start him? You know, do you start him and smart next to one another? Do you bring smart off the bench? You know, do you, I'm, I'm still looking at that bench kind of pop mm-hmm. and who's going to give the bench that pop. So Sadoransky, one way or another, could could be a real huge help. Uh, I see. I love this, and, and this is sort of like when we were sitting here saying the Celtics should really trade Kemba Walker to Oklahoma City for Al Horford because it makes a lot of sense. And I think if Chicago, especially as we hear rumblings about them being interested in a Lonzo Ball pursuit, there is an opportunity where they're going to have to either both shed cap clutter and get rid of point guards but so the the kobe white injury throws a little bit of a wrinkle in here they probably could use some depth at that position but they can probably get by the map the market is saturated with available point guards we'll get into that when we get to like free agent targets but you can get yourself a backup ball handler on the cheap and so i wonder if sadoransky would be available if you could take that 10 million dollars which is uh, non-guaranteed, five million of it is guaranteed, but the Celtics could absorb that whole contract and just send back a second round pick. And Chicago gets a little draft capital that they're thin on now that they've traded everything for uh, Nick Busevich. And uh, and 
they sort of get move a player that, as you said, had, they probably didn't live up to the full expectation that Chicago expected and gives them a little bit more freedom this summer to make moves. I think he's, he, he's, a, he's an ideal fit here because when I look at the point guard market, I keep coming back to just the Celtics need size at that position. If you're yeah. going to have Marcus Smart and then Peyton Pritchard coming off the bench, you know, I don't know as much as I love the Ishmiths of the world and all that. Do right. I want, do I want a six foot one, six foot two backup backcourt? I feel like, didn't we just go through this for five years where it's exploitable? And um, I, I just think if Ime Adoka has his druthers, it's to have a defensive minded team. And okay, you can get away with that with Marcus Smart, who's six, four and a bulldog, but uh, I don't know if necessarily there's the right options out there. Like, I, I you know, we can, we can talk some TJ McConnell and being a feisty sure. six foot one, but uh, I need some size at that position. I think that's why Sadoransky makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Another, another big guard I've, I, I put on my list is, uh, is, is calling Sacramento about DeLon Wright. Now on my list too. Yes. All right. Well, so let's just dive right into this because Again, I, I sit there and the, the, what's what's funny to me is Celtics fans always do this thing where they're like, you know, oh, I want to make this trade. And they, you never look at it from the other side. And I say, OK, let's flip the script because we sat here. I, I mean, I screamed for three and a half straight months about how Harrison Barnes, Harrison Barnes, Harrison Barnes. And then Sacramento was like, you know, kind of want to hold on to him, not yeah. make the playoffs. Totally botch that that scenario. And God bless him. But you know, how'd that work out for you? Uh, so now with DeLon Wright, they go and trade and get him out of Detroit. He was actually someone I thought the Celtics should have pursued hard uh, at the deadline last year because I thought he could really help them. Well, you know, I don't necessarily know what Sacramento's motivation is here outside of they have a lot of guards. They have, you know, reason to get off that that money if they want to use it elsewhere. And they need some draft capital to, to figure out how to put better pieces around. And, and, and we go back to the timeline thing, right? Like, uh, if you're building around your your younger players, then you know the Halliburtons and Foxes of the world. Then maybe there's a there's a pathway for the Celtics to inquire about DeLon Wright. And so you know maybe they even just picked them up at the deadline with that in mind that you know maybe we could flip this for for more than we gave up. Uh, so I wonder if the Celtics could get in on that because I love the size, I love the playmaking, I love the little scoring punch, uh, and I think it's just it, it, like you said, I, I'm more locked in that it's going to be smart Jalen Jason Rob and player X I don't know if, if DeLon Wright fits into that I don't know if Sadoransky fits into that but um they could carve out big roles and I don't think they necessarily bite into Peyton Pritchard's playing time Aaron Neesmith's playing time Romeo Langford's playing time so I, I really like the way he fits with this core and what he could bring to this group what I like about uh DeLon Wright and Jermichael Green in that starting lineup is that they're not they're not going to be high usage, and this is my fear with Evan Fournier that I think Fournier needs to be a little more high usage yeah. to be effective, and to do that you got to bring him off the bench. That's that I think is if we're going to get the money's worth with him, then that's we got to you got to give him more of those minutes. And hey, against second units, great, go off. The the, the lawn rights of the world can spot up they can be in the corner they can catch and shoot and hey attack a close out sure get the ball on the run go you know you can you can be a playmaker too in the flow of the offense but he's not hunting for his own shots he is in there to be a ball mover to be a spot up shooter and if opportunities open up the um open themselves up in the midst of all of that great but mm -hmm. you know that you've got jason tatum jalen brown Robert Williams waiting for lobs and Marcus Smart ready to knock your head off if you take up too much of his usage. <laughs> so you don't want that's that's the that's what I'm 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 putting in the starting lineup. Whether it's next to Marcus Smart or next to Robert Williams mm -hmm. at two or four spot, that to me is the priority. And then you go into the season and you see how it fits. And then you make your adjustments from there. But that is the priority to me. Some size somewhere in the backcourt. So like you said, some some starter somewhere in there next to those four guys, and and let's cook. All right. Is there anybody else on your TPE list that we uh, so that we should? Can can I throw? 
Can I count Tristan Thompson as basically a TPE because we're trading him away? <laughs> what? If- yeah, that, that's fair. I mean, if you can find someone, I'm I'm all. Yeah, I think Brad Stevens would be all ears if you can all find right. a potential trade destination. Okay, let me let me just throw out this crazy idea that crossed my mind, and I don't even know if it's a good idea. But Tristan Thompson and filler would be Carson Edwards to the Los Angeles Lakers for Kyle Kuzma. Why the Lakers selling low on Kuzma? Well, because he sucked in the playoffs. That's, that's my thing. Like, and he's just starting an extension. And this is why I don't, I don't even know if it's a good idea. But if you're, if you're done with Kuzma, and, and really, why would they sell low on Kuzma? Because LeBron said, I'm done with Kuzma. <laughs> that's, that's the scenario. The LeBron's like, get this guy the heck out of here, and I'm, I'm done with him. But you bring in Tristan Thompson. You need a backup big. They played to the, they won a championship together, LeBron and Tristan. All right. All right. You're, Give it you, to you, me, baby. You've got, you've got me at least thro- rolling it around in my head. Pull um, stretch. Chew on may, it. I don't maybe, think. Maybe sh- you could send him one of those like Carson Edwards, Cleveland Cavalier uh, hype videos where he made all the threes and, and, and yeah. maybe LeBron's on board. He's just, he's Tristan distracted. He doesn't care about the regular season. So that works over there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he cares about the postseason either, but uh, you know, uh, I, I like where your head's at. I think there, Tristan Thompson, if he's going to get traded, would be agreeable to go to a Los Angeles destination, and um, I can see some some potential avenues there. I just wonder. Don't think about it too much. I just yeah. threw it out there. I don't want you to, to burn brain power on a very bad. <laughs> here, here, I'll throw you. I'll throw you my lunatic uh, MLE. I mean, I'm sorry, TPE. Uh, scenario that that got me thinking. So Saric goes down for the Suns in game one of the NBA finals. They've got to get off money if they're going to bring back Chris Paul and with their with their bloated cap sheet. If you're the Celtics, you play the long game, call them up and go, hey, not going to be able to play next year, most of the season. I think you could maybe get them back for a playoff run, depending on how that ACL heals. Um, but and then, you know, maybe maybe get lucky, get them back there. It's, it's sort of a flyer. Uh, you know? I'll be honest with you, that thought has crossed my mind. I was looking through the things tonight and I saw Sarge. I was like, hmm. And then I said no, because I think they'd want to spend their money in a, a better way. But, and especially if they're, if they're concerned about the tax. Like if, if this was the Celtics with the New York Knicks, uh, you know, revenue streams, then yes. But I think the Celtics being as financially conscious as they are, I don't know that that's going to be something that they're, oh, we're going to pay this guy to sit out all year, but he would be good to hold on to. But then again, you don't know what he's going to be after the ACL injury, but the thought has crossed my mind. So. Yeah, I, I can tell you what he will be. He'll be better than whatever you've got at the four right now. And so um, <laughs> right. I, I kind of, I, I wonder, I wonder if it's, again, it's, it's, it's almost like a trade deadline acquisition that you'd make in the summer. And like you said, uh, Given their 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 cap commitments, I don't know if it's if it's ideal, but you know, these are the things you got to think about when you don't have a lot of resources. I mean, is playing the long game with Dario Saric a better chance for talent than anything else that's available? Like it would be great. Yeah, look, look, if Sadoransky and Delon Wright are all on the table, yeah, you don't wait. But just come, I'm trying to come up with crazy ideas that maybe can hey. help this team down the road, and that's what they've got to do. Like Brad and all these all, all, all these holdovers from the Ainge regime have to figure out what the best way to use that is. Let's take a quick break from the podcast to remind you that we are getting close to the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympics, the one night when the whole world comes together. The world's biggest show on the world's biggest stage. The opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympics, Friday, 730 Eastern on NBC. The other thing they have to figure out, transitioning to the mid-level exception, and for this game, we're gonna we're kind of focusing on the five point nine million dollar taxpayer. Now, again, so if the Celtics re-sign Evan Fournier, there's a good chance they're in the tax. I think it would be very, very difficult for them to use the non-taxpayer hard cap themselves essentially and really limit their flexibility. So. Uh, I think it's more likely than not that they will have only this 5.9 million puts them in a tough spot. A lot of contenders out there will still have the full nine and a half million dollar non-taxpayer to go kind of hunt talent. But if you, if, if, if Wick calls you up and says, okay, John Corrales, I've got $5.9 million of my money for you to spend. 
Uh, who's your first call? Okay, this one's tough because there's not a lot of great options here. But let's let's throw out a crazy idea. Let's just do it, right? Ooh, crazy off the top. Let's go crazy with it. Um, and I don't know if he's going to fall into this price range, but we need a stretch four, right? Mm -hmm. What about a guy who knows Boston? What about a reunion with Kelly Olenek? Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know if you saw Houston Kelly. Houston Kelly was is might might not be even content to make regular mid level money. Max 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 him out. Uh, you know this is a scenario where if the Celtics didn't want to hard cap themselves, I've dreamed up a lot of Kelly Olynyk sign and trade avenues. You know, get him his money and get him back. I mean, uh, I told Scal in our broadcast, hey, you know that is the perfect player. And uh, when he was when I, when we thought maybe he'd get waived from Houston who didn't want to win any games instead he just went up and jacked up his value because he was great yeah. at the end of the year it's so funny I thought the whole time you were setting that up you were going with Jeff Green no god no <laughs> <laughs> although yeah it, it, it what was that line somebody came up with it took Jeff Green getting paid the minimum to finally play up to his the, the value of his contract <laughs> um, I, I don't know you know fun. the one thing I will say is that your pitch to Kelly uh, as he's deciding his future is, is sort of what you laid out uh, with, you know, any other, any guy here is that come here for one year on short money. Uh, you know, it's probably not going to be the Celtics who are able to lock you up after that, but you're going to make your money. It's just a matter of can someone like Kelly sacrifice three million, three and a half million dollars to be a more featured player here when he could potentially, you know, it depends on where he goes. He could still be very spotlighted, but there's certainly a comfort level. I mean, if we're getting bands back together, let's just do it. Like do it. we got, got Horford. Let's, let's get Olenek. And like, can we see it in a, in a random pickup game or something? So I can figure out if, uh, <laughs> if I'm ready, if I'm ready to go down that Avenue for the point guard yeah. position. No, yeah, I, just, Why not? I, I just said, I need size at that position. I, know. Uh, I, I, I like where your head's at though. And uh, I think that's, that's that's pie in the sky and uh you know that would be really great if kelly would sort of look past what he's what he could probably truly earn but uh he doesn't have it though the best money for him is to resign in houston i i don't know if that's going to happen so um yeah i doubt it I, so brad yeah. stevens needs to make that call and go kelly we never wanted to lose you uh, <laughs> right right we we helped you get paid down there in miami you know it's time to come home and restore that value and be the stretch four that this team has Desperately, desperately needed since your departure. My stretch four guy with the uh, MLE is Rudy Gay. And so a okay. couple reasons there. He has a little bit of the San Antonio connection. Has uh, Him and, and, and Odoka have spent some time together down there. I think I've lopped like uh, probably five different San Antonio players in there because like just under the guise of they know the coach. You know, you, you can right. throw Jeff. Right. Jeff that's part of the reason I throw Jeff Green in there because he got right. part of the uh, EMA experience last year. Patty Mills on your list. I mean, uh, Patty Mills is. Uh, is don't jump ahead. Don't don't look. Don't read ahead here. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a full. I, you know, there are very few guys with that with the MLE that I'll write a full story on. Uh, but Patty Mills was well timed too. I don't know if you saw that, but I wrote it on the day that Australia took down America in the in the Olympic qualifiers. Oh, the uh, Olympic. Patty Olympics. went nuts in the fourth quarter. I love and, it. And I said. Uh, Oh, great. Now he's priced himself out of Boston's range. Although most GMs know that uh, international Patty is a, is a different beast. Uh, Rudy Gay just intrigued me, you know, going to be 35. I think the price tag is finally going to be low enough where the Celtics could muscle their way in there. You know, you have to start thinking what are the priorities for Rudy Gay? You know, he's made a ton of money in his career. I think it's finally a chance for him after Sacramento and San Antonio's of the world to, to really be on a competitive team. And so, uh, at least the recent San Antonio squad. So maybe there's a chance where that, that would be attractive. And again, I think your pitch to all of these guys is there's there's a huge role available for a point guard or a power forward. You know, we can the, the Celtics can give you more minutes than and a bigger opportunity than a lot of these destinations that that might otherwise be looking at you as a as a role player or someone who might fade from the rotation. Uh, so I, I, I make the call. I know I know Rudy Gay is not Rudy Gay of, of, of five years ago, but still a bucket getter. 
still seems like he kills the Celtics every time he plays them. I love the size. I love the versatility at that big spot. He can play some small ball five. Uh, so give me, give me some Rudy Gay in my life. Okay. Okay. What um, else you got? I'm going to go with Nemanja Bielitsa as, Ooh. you know, a, a 6'10", stretch four. Now, not going to provide you the same level of defense as some of these guys are, that we're talking about are. But again, some level of defense. I mean, we, you know who you're getting when you sign that boy. Right. <laughs> That's right. So I was trying to be, I was trying to be polite. <laughs> yeah, you are. Uh, so, uh, but look, stretch four, and and he he probably isn't the guy that's that's going to walk into the starting lineup, and that might be a concern for him. But there are going to be opportunities for him to be out there uh, stretching the floor, and and at five point nine doesn't have to even be the whole five point nine. I mean, let's let's make sure that we're saving a little bit of money to to bring in Yam Madar, right? Yeah. Like that's going to be a an option. <laughs> it's, it's possible that they are going to bring him in, and that's how they're going to they're going to need some of that money. So, splitting up the MLE, you you can throw maybe four million at Bielitsa yeah. and and have a, a good stretch for option off the bench. Maybe the change of scenery in a place that will actually kind of respect his skill set might actually kind of work for him in, you know, I'll, I'll say limited minutes, but like what, 20 minutes or so. That, that's not a bad, that's not a bad gig to have. I, I, I'm with you. I mean, I think you could have had him last year if you really wanted him, but same deal, you know, maybe different, different people in charge now making stronger plays for these players. Uh, maybe some, it's a guy Brad really wants. And uh, I mean, you went from Kelly Olenek to bargain bin Kelly Olenek with that, that, with that choice. So uh, <laughs> I'm there. All right, I was going to go with Patty Mills at, at, as part of my list. Cause I, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm worried about the cost and him having like this great Olympic and Australia getting a medal and everybody's just saying, Oh yeah, Patty Mills is really good at basketball and we need that energy. We need that shot making. I'm also slightly concerned about a Patty Mills, Peyton Pritchard backcourt, you know, same deal. Like, you know, that Patty Mills is a willing defender, much like Kemba, but that doesn't mean it translates to uh, being the sort of defense that the Celtics need to get back to in order to being successful. And I might, I wonder if that would be just a little undersized. So let me, let me stick with an, with an Aussie point guard, Dante Exum. So <laughs> I, I knew you were going to laugh as soon as I said it. Now, because, I, I was hoping you were going to like do a Ben Simmons. Joke <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, I just, that was, that's what we call in the business a tease because uh, I should, if I, I would have thrown to break, if, uh, if I was really doing the, doing the real broadcast, I would have said, I'm going to tell you about a point guard from Australia that the Celtics should really go coming up after this. <laughs> and then we would have come back and I would have been talking Dante Exum instead of Ben Simmons and people would have been so mad that they stayed through that break. Um, <laughs> I am not convinced that a team that has navigated oodles and oodles of injuries the past few years should be rolling the dice on anybody with the injury history that Dante Exum has had. Uh, I do not believe that Dante Exum will come close to the hype that I saw when he was a 19 year old at the pre-draft combine in Chicago. And there was like a, like there's just the biggest scrum of people around him uh, because of, of the hype of what he could be, but has size, has playmaking and as I try to talk myself into some of these point guards, you know, there's worse flyers to take. And it sort of goes back to what you said in terms of, I don't know if I want to give them the full taxpayer mid-level, but, you know, some of these guys, they're just with the saturation of point guards out there, are going to have to settle for, for low money. And so could you take a flyer where if it doesn't work out, you know, you trade floats them at some point, it gets bundled with you know, whoever is the next guy out the door and you, uh, and you just move on and you punt and, or, you know, maybe you do a short-term deal and you don't care. But uh, I, I somehow, like, if you had asked me this list 24 hours ago, I, Dante Exum wouldn't have been near. And then somehow I went down a, a Dante Exum wormhole this morning. And, and here, we, <laughs> here we are, as I try to talk myself into it. Uh, look, it, it's, it's a name that's come up for me before too. I'm, I'm with you I, on the injury thing. The, the injuries just scare me too much. Mm -hmm. And it's, for everything that you said, like the last thing the Celtics need is to bring a guy in, have him play well, go, wow, reclamation project. And then boom, something happened. Um, that the, it, it's kind of sad that that's, the, that's where we are with him, but that, that, that's where I am with him. Right? So bring some sanity into me. What do you, who do you got? Who else you got on your MLE oh, list? Sanity. Um, <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm glad you're going to stay off the grid. There we go. Uh, okay. So 
Um, I'm, I'm going to focus here on size in the backcourt off the bench. And I'm thinking that maybe Chris Dunn. Okay. Uh, the problem with Chris Dunn is he's got a $5 million player option in Atlanta. So the question is, do the Celtics convince him to drop that and sign in Boston mm-hmm. and have to kind of match that? Um, or do you try to maybe use – some of the uh, Kemba Walker trade exception. Well, he would fit. I mean, if it's, is it five million exactly? I, I had not oh, considered Chris. A little Dunn. more than five. Ah, so it's That's outside the, the it's outside the uh, the Cantor MLE. So uh, outside of Cantor, it's outside of Tice, but it fits into Kemba Walker. So mm-hmm. so there's a six point eight Kemba Walker TPE there that if the Celtics really wanted to, and if Atlanta, um, I don't know, they, they salary wise they're okay, but. You know, they could acquire him that way. I just look at him as obviously we talk about size, we talk about defense. This is a, a good situational guard, in my opinion, to bring in if you can, because obviously I, I like Marcus Smart as the starting point guard. Peyton Pritchard is going to come in and have his moments, but obviously small and can get picked on defensively. Chris Dunn's going to come in and have his moments, but obviously you can't rely on him for much offensively. So you kind of play back and forth. You know, you, do you want the guy who can pull up from 35 feet? Then Peyton Pritchard's going to come on in. And, and if you want a guy that can be a, a pretty good lockdown guy next to Marcus Smart and you're protecting a four-point lead, then that's the guy that you bring in. So I'm, I'm looking to bolster the bench with size and defense. I, I like where your head's at again. I, it's not someone I had considered. Uh, as you're talking, I just kind of laughed to myself and said, imagine telling, what was it, 2017 Celtics fans, uh, not only are you going to not draft Chris Dunn and take Jalen Brown, <laughs> but don't worry because five years from now or four years from now, you're just going to flip a random trade exception. <laughs> Imagine telling fans back in 2017 you're going to have Kemba, Kemba trade exception to get <laughs> Chris Dunn. Uh, yeah, that would that would have been quite the quite the quite the wormhole or, or experience <laughs> to go down. Uh, but yeah, I, I I love the idea, and I mean, you, you kind of always hold out hope in in much the same vein. Of the Exum, you you know you always want to hope that your team can be the reclamation project and get the the most out of these guys and put them in su- su- position to be successful. And let's face it, when you're playing with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and you know potential third star down the road, like there there's talent here to just let you do your thing and kind of play free. And there's a little bit of, of expectations and all that that come with it, but uh, there's going to be minutes and there's going to be opportunity. And sometimes that's all a guy really needs to. Uh, to, to, to go. Uh, I did have Ish Smith on my list. I'm going to go quick with this one. Just Celtics killer all-stars includes him and Chris Middleton. And so if you could just not have to play him four times a year, sign me up for Ish Smith. Uh, obvious size concerns there, but I love his playmaking and, uh, and all that. And I think sometimes in that backup point guard role, that's all you need is just someone who can facilitate. Uh, I briefly talked myself into Alfred Payton, and but then yeah. I was like, and, but then I was like he just started like 68 games for the Knicks so I maybe he won't even be in that price range or the, maybe the Knicks will overpay to keep him I don't know I don't know what's going to happen there but um the only other guy on my list and I have to to get him in as we as we navigate these mid-level guys is Justice Winslow so he has a 10 million dollar option with the Grizzlies I cannot imagine that they're going to pick that up uh I believe he will fall on the scrap heap of available free agents. And I don't think there's going to be many people clamoring to pick him up. Or if there are, it's going to be teams like the Celtics who can promise, Hey, you know, there's opportunity here. We believe in you and you can kind of find your way here and you can do it while playing for a very competitive team. And I think there'll be multiple aspects of this that would uh, entice a player like Justice Winslow, who I don't think gets above the taxpayer mid-level to uh, whatever comes next because he has to kind of reprove himself here. And, um, but I love the versatility. I love that you can play a little bit of point guard and handle the ball in some units, but he could also slide up and play the four and gives you that grit and sort of defensive toughness that they've lacked. Uh, If you can't have Jay Crowder back, maybe you get some of the, uh, I don't want to kind of, say that then they're not very similar players but uh they they could be if 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 justice winslow got back to the player that danny ainge had busted after and i think ultimately that is why i want to make this move it's like a tip of the cap to danny ainge it's like you're gone gone but not forgotten like just gonna say (laughs) it 
it, of course, once Danny Ainge leaves, the Celtics <laughs> finally get Justice Winslow. And they didn't have to give up 10 first round picks to get him. Mm. What a, uh, what yeah. a pivot point in Celtics history. It, 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 That's it, gotta it, happen. It's just laced with irony, and I do need it to happen because I think it'd be not, perfect. Another reason why I want that to happen is just the sheer blood sport between all of us beat writers to be the one to write that story. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had it in draft mode for the last four years. So uh, maybe, get the maybe first more. one-on-one with Justice Winslow as a member of the Celtics. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite moments is uh, I think me and Jay King wandered over to the heat locker room one year and uh, you know, talked to Justice Winslow in one of his first games against Boston about the report that, you know, not, it's not even a report. It's gospel now uh, that the Celtics had, had offered up to, to four first round picks for his services and he kind of dismissed it and said, hey, I'm in Miami. Like, what what were we really expecting him to say? But it was a funny moment because we said, well, you know, how many first round picks should it have taken to land Justice Winslow? And Chris Anderson, Birdman, sitting there all tattoos up next to him. He's like, at least five. You know, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, hey, that was a confidence boost for the for the rookie at that time. But uh, anybody else on your on your MLE list that uh, that you, you want to throw out there before you move it on? Um, Alec Burks. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a free. I guy. have ooed every every. I like it's so funny. As long as I know the name, I'm hey, gonna hey, like hey. I'm gonna ooh it. So right, uh, let, me, let me throw let me throw another one out there. You right. think Nicholas Batum is is done in in the with the Clippers? Can 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 they get him for that kind of money? I think he might have priced himself out. I thought he had a really good regular season. I yeah, mean, I know, that's you know. that's the question, and it's so funny that in Charlotte he's like, oh, we got to dump his salary. Yeah. Then he goes to L.A. and he re you know, kind of reclaims his value. And I, you're right. I, I don't know if he's, if he's going to make 5.9, he might actually make like, I don't know, eight, 10, something like that. And I don't know. I don't What's the right situation for the Clippers? Like, can they, I always, because he was trait, he, he was technically a, a, he signed after, so he, they don't have his rights, right? They, they don't have early birds. They have, right? have like, non bird rights, which non-bird, is, so it's just nothing like you can't, you can't, I mean, whatever it is 20 percent above the minimum above, right so uh if they had traded for him obviously you get your rights you know maybe it's it, it opens a pathway for them because they gotta they gotta do whatever they can to retain talent but um no i mean they're in a tough spot with that because 120 percent raise might not you know probably get it done because i think he can find it's it also comes up to what's important for him at this point i think the selling point is you have uh you send evan fournier uh, over to these Olympics with the idea of wrapping his arm or, or you know, Nick Tomb shows up or whatever. And it's just like, Hey, uh, you know, we could use a guy like you in Boston and we need more French people. Maybe have Yabu Sally throwing a good word. Uh, I don't know. And it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm scraping, I'm scraping Absolutely. here for, uh, I love it. French big baguettes are great in Boston. I don't, I, I don't know what the, what the pitch is, but, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, Fourier. I mean, look, we, we, every French player, is required to come through Boston at some point. We've gotten down to Poirier, yeah. all right? Batum has to, like, he has to. I, I, I feel like we found the pitch. It's that, you know, every single French player will at least put in a somewhat good word for him. Like, I think Poirier probably still liked his Boston tenure, at least hanging out with Evan Fournier and, and wearing snazzy, snazzy clothes. Uh, all right. Uh, that conversation went a lot longer than I wanted, but uh, I enjoyed it because I think it's it's such a fun exercise to try and figure out, you know, where do they go and how do they maximize these assets? Because it's critical to what comes next. We heard Brad Stevens say in the aftermath of hiring Ime Adoka, like they need more talent. They're just not as constructed. They are not good enough. And as we wait for the Milwaukee Bucks to, to polish off and raise a, to- a trophy, uh, it's, it's, it's imperative that the Celtics get better because the Nets are going to be there and like the East is good. So, uh, they have to find a way. I want to wrap with this Jason Tatum heading to Tokyo. I just kind of want to reflect on the exhibition slate and what, what, what was, what's your overall takeaway from watching what Tatum did in those four games or, th- you know, three games and sitting out one, uh, what, what, what's, what's your, uh, was it, what were your expectations and where did he fall in line? Yeah, you know, my expectations, I, I didn't know where what, what to expect because you've got Kevin Durant out there. You've got Damian Lillard. You had Bradley Beal before the COVID. You have a lot of guys out there that can score. And I just was always wondering, where where is Tatum? Where's the hierarchy here? Because of those guys, he's fourth, I think, 
in, in, you know, you've got Dame, obviously Dame time, you got KD, who's the best player in the world. And, and obviously Beal was going to big bro his way to shots before Tatum. So like, Hey, I'm older than you, man. I got, <laughs> I, I eat first, right? You got to wait. So then where does that leave Tatum? And what I, what I will say that I liked from Tatum is that last game against Spain, the game turned as the ball flowed through Tatum and he became a facilitator. There was a point there where I tweeted out, it was like basically seven minutes to go in the third quarter where um, Tatum was leading the U S in assists with two and he ended up with five. And then all of a sudden, like the, the, the ball started popping through him and he became this facilitator. And then he started patrolling the baseline against the zone, kind of waiting for the zone to the guys to kind of creep up and he mm-hmm. snuck in behind them. Very smart was cutting really well. And it kind of reminded me back to like sort of rookie year type of Tatum where, Hey, I've got these guys around me that are, are going to be the scorers. I want to score. What do I do to do that? So it's, Get, get the ball and move it, and hopefully you get it back or cut or, you know, get into the soft spots of his own or rebound and go coast to coast. Mm. So he's doing all of those little things that he's going to need to do to be effective. And every once in a while, he'll slide on up and he'll get hot from three and they'll start feeding him and he'll have his 30-point game. But I liked that in that last exhibition, he started to go into kind of the little things mode and, and what we saw on the floor was, hey, when the U.S. does the little things and they play hard, they move the ball, they could be pretty damn good. Do you think Jason Tatum texted Brad immediately after that game and said, you know, I just I, I think I don't think you're going to put Jalen Brown on the table for uh, for uh, for uh, Damian Lillard. But uh, can, you, can you make sure that doesn't happen so that I still get 20 shots per game in Boston? Right, right. <laughs> How many times did Dame come down and just like shoot right away? And Tatum's like getting ready to get to his spots and turns like, oh, <laughs> it's already up. Okay, I'll just go back this way now. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think he, uh, I think he understands. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that come with playing with elite talent, but just don't know if that pairing, you know, hey, love you, Cedric Maxwell. Love that you're on our network screaming about, you know, you trade Jalen Brown for Damian Lewis in a heartbeat. Uh, put me in the complete opposite category. Uh, I, I just, I just don't see it. And I know Celtics fans, Celtics fans have been calling me a wet blanket for like three months now. And I'm sorry, I'm just bringing you some real, t- real re- uh, reality. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to inject the sound. You got a little side hustle. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, my, my side hustle is, is Robert Williams, but um, you know, I do have to bring a little realness to this conversation because there is a thing called the salary cap. And, you know, that, I mean, 46 million for 46 shots per game. And I just don't know if that's the best path. It would be fascinating to watch. Like I, I'll fully relent. I'm, I'd be sure. fascinated to watch Tatum and Lillard on a night to night basis. I just do not think that is the best path forward for this team. So I thought Tatum had two really good quarters to start his exhibition slate. I thought it went all to hell for the next probably week where, you know, not only does he play really bad, I thought he had some really bad defensive moments, just kind of losing guys, especially, you know, around the basket. And maybe that's, I don't know, some of that. I want to blame some of it on FIBA, but uh, I think Pop just got frustrated at times with him. And um, then the right knee soreness, then poor Bradley Beal goes down with COVID and that plan goes to hell. So uh, good to see him really sort of restore my faith and why this experience is important for him in that fourth quarter the other night, because, just like you said, his playmaking was exquisite. I think we know for the Celtics to go to another level, that has to be a part of his game in making other guys better. And I know it's it's easy to make, you know, Lillard and Durant look good, but uh, he's got to figure out how to do that with Jalen Brown and Nevin Fournier and find a way to, to be more than a scorer. And I think that's so important. I do wonder if Brad legitimately calls Pop. And because you think about two years ago when, Jalen went over for the FIBA and he was defending a bunch of fours and playing up a little bit. I feel like that was Brad, like, Hey pop, if you get anything out of this, can you just like right. get, 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 get Jalen to understand, like he needs to do that. He needs to be able to play up. He can't just guard wings. Got to be able to guard bigger players. I feel like he called pop this time. was like, Hey, we're hiring an Adoka. Uh, that's great. Thanks for the recommendation. Also, uh, can you just please tell Jason Tatum to pass like five assists per game? 
like whatever you need to do. And we'll take care of the rest when he gets back to Boston. And so uh, I do, I, I'm excited to see what he does. I do think there is a tremendous opportunity for all of these guys, all eight healthy American players heading to Tokyo. Uh, but I think Tatum needs to sort of grasp it and it's okay if he's not the high scorer, uh, but you do those little things, you rebound, you assist, and you come home with a gold medal. And maybe there's a little uh, boost that comes for this Celtics team going into next year. Yeah, I like the fact that Udoka is there and yeah. that he's he's getting this head start and that Tatum has to realize all of the things that you just said and that when he does it well, he not only has Greg Popovich kind of gassing him up and saying, That's, this is what we need you to do. He's got his, his future head coach here saying, yes, this is how I, this is how I see you playing in, in this system that I'm trying to do. So already putting the thought in his head like, this thing that you did at this time, watch the game film immediately so it can burn into mm. his memory and say, this right here, I plan to see this five times a game next season because that's how we want you to play and that's how we think you're going to be an MVP candidate. So I like the fact that he's got that immediate kind of uh, return on his play already there with, with Udoka. I hadn't even thought about that. I did love that Instagram clip where – Udoka was kind of prodding him into more bully ball. And I said, oh, man, Celtics fans are going to lose their mind over this because that's exactly what we want to see, more aggressive Jason Tatum. Uh, two things before I let you go. Are you rooting for, for Giannis and your, your, your Greekness? <laughs> my, my Greekness, yes. I'll, I'll show you something. Hold on. I'm going to dip down here. This is the Giannis Intentacumpo shoe. Wait, did you just take that off or was it just in front of you? I've already had it off. Okay. But- it's customized. I'll show you here. It's got the oh, Greek wow. flag on oh, that's, there. That's awesome. So I, I, had to, I had to support the fellow Greek. And also, you know, just, just to give a shout out here to the Nigerian national team, mm. Giannis of Nigerian descent as well. Um, they're, they're having a moment right now. Ime Odoka as the head coach yeah. of the Celtics and all of that. So, you know, just give a slight shout out to the Nigerian national team. But yeah. I, I've always kind of like sided a little bit Milwaukee, but also look, small market team kept mm-hmm. their star, went all in with Holiday. You know, all of the things that a, you hope a small market team does, they did, and it, it paid off. And and hopefully, it, it you get that culmination. So, um, I would like to see it all work out for Milwaukee. Yeah, and I, I think that's part of it too. Is just I like Milwaukee as a city. You know, people always say like, "Oh, what do you go? What do you do when you're in Milwaukee? Like the food's great, the beer's great." Like, oh my god, cheese I, with everything. Cheese, not not just cheese, but cheese curds on like literally everything. I could live at AJ Bombers. I had beer and, cheese soup. I never knew what beer cheese soup was, and I had that in Milwaukee. It's it doesn't even, it's, it makes sense, but it was beer cheese soup. What more can you want in a winter in Milwaukee? I mean, awesome. I, <laughs> nothing really. And, and it was also the last place we visited before this all went down. So uh, the, before the world shut down. Uh, were you on that trip? Were you in the Indy? I, I went from Indy back home. So I was at the last, I didn't go you. to the, I didn't go to Milwaukee. I flew home from Indy. So I was at the last, the last game. You were a smart man. I don't know if you were uh, prescient or just lucky based on no, your I itinerary. I actually screwed up the travel plans. I screwed up the travel plans and I was supposed to do that trip and I mm-hmm. screwed it up and they ended up at that point at Mass Live sending Tom Wester home, but he, he canceled that trip. I got them to cancel good, it. Good, good I was for like, him. I don't, I don't know if I, I, I'm sure I've told the story on the, on the pod before, but I, I literally, I stayed an extra day in Indy after the game there to do some Gordon Hayward stuff for Gordon Hayward day we had planned and got to meet a lot of his, you know, childhood basketball for, uh, teammates. And that was, a, that was a lot of fun, but I caught a flight that second night up to uh, Chicago was my connection. Cause of course you can't get to Milwaukee from anywhere right. without connecting. And as I get on my connecting flight in Chicago, the league sent out the email that said the rest of the season has been postponed. And I, I, I contemplated, what do I do? They were like, I run for the door because I think they had just closed the door and like, okay, maybe I can get a flight home from Boston because getting home from Milwaukee is decidedly more difficult. Uh, it all worked out. And thank you, Delta Airlines, for having some availability that next morning. Uh, but it honestly feels like a lifetime ago. And uh, yeah, I guess, you know, and now here I am 
it's talking in this basement for month number 18 of, uh, of, of my life. Meanwhile, you have, you have a new studio and that was going to be my other question. Did you purposely put that throw pillow uh, to that spot so that it would be, I made, I'm, yeah, that, so it was a little further over this way, mm, I and I tell. wanted a super cool new throw pillow to be kind of I uh, I would be lying if I said that as I set up backgrounds, um, that I that I do not shamelessly do that, but if you could see Studio B in the in the Forsberg basement here, you would see that I have, uh, I had to, I moved like a bookshelf in, that I put some figurines on, and then I have a Boston sign, and I don't utilize it anymore because it's just, it's just easy over here now, but <laughs> um, but yeah, I would definitely move like, I would move a guitar into the into the region, just like just like a golf club, some something. Oh, that, oh, just, that thing! I just yeah, came oh, casually. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, oh, oh! You saw my Emmy back there. <laughs> <laughs> How did that get in there? That was uh, supposed yeah. to be somewhere else. I, uh, yeah, I meant I meant to put that back into back into storage where, where yeah. I, I don't display it prominently during family gathering. Uh, but. All right, well, that was an hour. I, I'm not going to admit, John Corrales, you are a professional podcaster because I did not think we were going to get an hour in the slowest week of the uh, of the last 18 months, uh, and yet here we are. We I think we put out a, a phenomenal product. Good you know, you. that's hey, thank you very much. You know, look, I have to do this every day, Monday through Friday, but still doing it, man. It's the it's a labor I, of love. I it is, and I I have the gift of gab. I yeah. love to talk. I'm happy to talk. I'll talk about nothing for 30 minutes and make it into something, man. Well, Whatever. producer producer Casey fell asleep a half hour ago. Uh, I guarantee <laughs> it, unfortunately. So uh, I need everybody to go check out John on Boston Sports Journal. Go like and subscribe both to the Celtics Talk podcast, but also the Locked On podcast. John does a great job with it. He's on YouTube now, too, just like us. Uh, I want to say we were a trailblazer in that regard. We started filming the Ennis Cantor show during uh, right before the pandemic. And now it feels like all the podcasts are going to, to YouTube. So uh, I'm just, I'm just going to take a victory lap there. So sure. uh, everybody go subscribe, especially on that YouTube page, get notified when a new episode goes up. Uh, the fireworks are coming one way or another, if you consider Justice Winslow fireworks. So we'll catch you next time on the Celtics Talk podcast.